Claiming that the Bible contains scientific facts and foreknowledge is a very admirable claim. While it may not prove that the Bible was inspired by Yahweh, it would at least give it some credibility, and certainly warrant some deeper and more serious evaluation. If a religious text were written or at least guided by the creator or creators of life and the cosmos as well as time itself, it should certainly be scientifically advanced, or at least scientifically literate, and most likely contain knowledge far beyond the cultures of the era it was written in, or even our own. So let's look at the top 10 scientific facts in the Bible. Bible, in a video essay composed by Ray Comfort, a very popular evangelical known for producing a plethora of Christian content online and in mainstream media. He's best known for the atheist illusion and as the banana man. Behold the atheist's nightmare. <laughs> Notice how gracefully it sits over the human hand. Notice it has a point at the top for ease of entry, it's just the right shape for the human mouth. His filmography started the same year that I was born. I would classify that as a coincidence, but Ray Comfort might associate that with some form of higher power. So let us begin. At a time when it was believed that the earth sat on a large animal or on a giant 1500 years before Christ, the Bible spoke of the earth's free float in space. He hangs the earth on nothing. Science didn't discover that the earth hangs on nothing until 1650, 3000 years later. While it may not have been scientifically proven that the Earth is free-floating in space until a few hundred years ago, it was not commonly believed that it wasn't. Even many ancient flat Earth models depict the Earth as a disk floating or flying through space. Even modern flat Earthers typically believe that, so even cultures who are completely scientifically ignorant had and have enough understanding of the cosmos and the night sky to understand that our planet is at least floating among the stars. Even the examples that Ray gives, like the Greek myth of Atlas holding of the heavens and the Hindu myth of the Earth sitting on four elephants in a sea turtle, these are all stories, and they likely weren't meant to be taken literally, but even so, the Hindus did not and do not believe that the earth is literally resting on the backs of elephants. Their oldest text, the Rig Veda, was written at least 4,000 years ago, and in Book 10, Chapter 22 and Verse 14, it reads, The earth is devoid of hands and legs, yet it moves ahead. All the objects above the earth move with it, and it moves around the sun. The Vedas are significantly older than the Bible, and yet still more scientifically advanced. Not only does this verse in the Rig Veda reveal the same knowledge of the Earth that Ray Comfort is proposing that the ancient Israelites had, but it also describes the Earth as orbiting around the Sun, and not the other way around, which the Bible does assert in Ecclesiastes 1.5 and Joshua 10.12-13. And on top of that, the Bible says that the Earth does not move. It is unmoving, which is far from the truth. Not only does the Earth spin and orbit around the Sun, but the Sun, our solar system, our galaxy, and even our local cluster are all moving. Absolutely nothing Nothing in this universe, or the universe itself, are unmoving. And despite Job 26 and 7, the Bible still describes the earth as having pillars in many, many verses. Maybe these were metaphors, but it's still there. And why would the creator of the universe need to use metaphors when reality is exponentially more impressive? Why refer to the earth as having pillars when he could have explained how the earth is anchored to the sun by its gravitational pull, and how the sun is a star which is 109 times larger than our own planet, and how the sun contains 99.86? 6% of, of all of the mass in our entire solar system. And why refer to the sky as a canvas or tapestry when he could have explained that the stars we see in the sky are like our own sun, but many of them are thousands of times larger? And why couldn't he have clarified that some of the bright dots we see in the sky are not in fact stars, but rather planets, and some of the specks we see are actually entirely different galaxies, millions of light years away, containing trillions more stars and trillions more planets? And then go on to explain that there are billions or trillions more galaxies out there that are so far away that their light hasn't even reached us yet, and is it a coincidence that the Bible contains more and more metaphors as our scientific understanding grows? And when he who has a discharge is cleansed of his discharge, then he shall count for himself seven days for his cleansing, wash his clothes, and bathe his body in running water. Then he shall be clean. Nowadays, doctors wash their hands in running water. But it wasn't too long ago that they did so in a bowl of still water. 
leaving invisible germs on their hands. Out of all of the claims of scientific foreknowledge in this video, this is the most commonly used by Christians. I've heard this argument several times from people that I know personally. I never really bothered refuting it, however, because it's completely inconsequential. If the ancient Jews were the first to practice hand washing, so what? The Muslims invented chess, algebra, and hundreds of surgical tools that we still use today. The ancient Egyptians, Greeks, Sumerians, and Indians all discovered and invented things as well. Does this verify that their religions are true? Every culture has contributed something to science, math, literature, etc. So if the Jews began the tradition of hand washing, it wouldn't make their religion any more true. This seems rather obvious, but it apparently isn't. And to argue this is laughable. Ray Comfort and anyone proposing that Leviticus 15.13 is the origin of hand washing are embarrassingly illiterate of their own holy book, or disgracefully dishonest to themselves and their audience as they desperately dig for anything potentially scientifically advanced in a book of hocus pocus. Reading the chapter that this verse is in is all that's needed to reveal that Ray Comfort's claim here is is false. Leviticus 15, 1-15 is instructing the Israelites on what to do when every man has an unclean genital discharge. Most likely this is referring to a urinary tract infection, but unlike how Ray Comfort is presenting this chapter, it's not a gem of medical knowledge. Verses 1-3 through say that when every man has a discharge, he is unclean. Verses 4-12 through say that anything that the man who has a discharge touches is also unclean. If he lays on a bed or sits on anything, they are unclean as well. And if someone else touches a piece of furniture or object that the man has touched, they will also be ritually unclean clean until that evening, and then they'll magically be better. And even if the man who has the discharge spits on anyone else for whatever reason he may have, they are also ritually unclean. If he touches a piece of pottery, they are commanded to break it. But if it's a wooden vase, they can just rinse it out. Then verses 13 through 15 instruct that the man who has the discharge is to go wash himself in running water, most likely a river or creek, along with his clothes, for seven days and then return on the eighth day and bring two pigeons or turtle doves to the entrance of the tent meeting and give them to the priest as a sin offering for his discharge. Apparently, having a UTI is a crime against Yahweh. So boys and girls, this is why modern surgeons sacrifice birds and bathe for a week after every surgical procedure. The entire chapter is full of superstitious rituals. It's far from being a medical textbook. It also has nothing to do with washing hands. But there are some verses in the Bible that do directly mention hand washing, and I'm surprised that Ray Comfort neglected to mention them. In Exodus 30, verse 17 through 21, Yahweh tells Moses to make a bronze bowl and fill it with water and put it in front of the altar of the Lord. And before anyone enters in to make an offering to him, they are to wash their hands and their feet in the bowl, and it will remain there for many generations. Wait, so Yahweh ordered dozens of men to not only wash their hands, but their nasty feet as well, in the same bowl of still water, leaving behind invisible germs? They did so in a bowl of still water, leaving invisible germs on their hands. And in Mark 7, not even Jesus' disciples washed their hands before they ate food. And when the Pharisees addressed it to Jesus, he defended them, saying that it wasn't important. So apparently, hand washing wasn't important to Jesus Christ. But let's ignore all of that and pretend that Leviticus 15 is indeed a medical revelation from Yahweh himself, informing his favorite ethnic group on how to rid themselves of germs. Why didn't he do a better job? Even with running water, water can only eradicate up to 40% of germs, whereas soap kills between 95 and 100%. And soap was already around at this time. Babylonians were using soap as far back as 2800 BCE, and the Egyptians as far back as 1500 BCE. And not only did the ancient Egyptians have soap, but a mass majority of them actually bathed in running water in the river. Bathing was a daily practice in ancient Egypt, and not simply a ritual for anyone who had an infected ejaculation. So again, the ancient Egyptians bathed in running water on a regular basis and used soap. Why was the creator of the universe's hygiene method 60% less effective than pagan cultures? And why could couldn't he give better instructions for anyone suffering from a UTI, rather than jump in the creek for a week and murder two turtle doves? Some aloe vera and cranberry juice would be much more salubrious. Leviticus 17 verse 11 says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls for it is the blood that makes atonement. Most of us don't think too much about the fact that a doctor can find out the health of our flesh by taking a sample of our blood. But the test can evaluate the health of our kidneys, our liver, thyroid and heart. Among other things, the blood can reveal diseases and conditions such as cancer, AIDS, diabetes, anemia and coronary heart disease. However, the great biological truth about blood revealing the health of our flesh wasn't fully comprehended until comparatively recent years. Up until 120 years ago, people were bled, 
and many died because of the practice. Nowadays, we know that sick people need blood, so we give them transfusions. Rather than removing it, we replace it or replenish it, because blood gives life to the flesh. More than a thousand years before Christ, the Bible stated this recently discovered biological truth. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. What even are you talking about, Ray? Did you even read the verse above it? If I was a Christian, I would be embarrassed of you right now. At least in your last example, you were just cherry picking the verse. Now you're just picking out a couple words from a verse and shamelessly ripping them out of context and sending them to f***ing space. Let's actually go through this passage. It starts in Leviticus 17.10 and goes to verse 16. In verse 10 and 11, Yahweh is telling the Israelites that no one is to eat blood, and if they do, he will disown them, because blood is the source of life, and that same blood is what makes atonements. In other words, it is how we make amends with him if we sin, which is why the Jews had to sacrifice animals to get forgiveness. Blood was apparently the only currency that Yahweh would accept, but instead of their own, they would use sheep or some birds in their place. Blood sacrifices with humans and animals were common in many superstitious cultures. So there was a general understanding, even by ancient people, that blood was important. In verses 12 through 13, Yahweh repeats that no one is to eat blood, even animals' blood, and if a hunter kills an animal, he is to cover the blood on the ground with dirt. Then in verse 14 through 16, he repeats that nobody is allowed to eat blood, and if you do eat an animal that has blood in it, you are commanded to wash your clothes, I don't know what relation that has, and you will be ritually unclean until that evening, and then you're magically clean again. But if you don't follow those commandments, you will bear your guilt. These verses are just Yahweh explaining that he doesn't want anyone to eat blood, which is great, but there is nothing here teaching the Israelites on how to perform blood work and check for cancer or AIDS, which I'm sure many of them had, or how to give anyone blood transfusions or anything of that sort, not anything that Ray Comfort mentions. There's nothing more to even discuss here. I'm disappointed, Ray, and most likely a lot of Christians are rolling their eyes at you along with me. The scriptures tell us that the earth is round. Isaiah 40, 22 says, It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. The word translated circle is the Hebrew word chud, which is also translated circuit or compass, depending on the context. That is, it indicates something spherical, rounded or arched, not something that's flat or square. The book of Isaiah was written sometime between 740 and 680 BC. Yes, the verse uses the word circle or compass, both of which simply refer to a two-dimensional shape. A compass is a tool used to draw a perfect circle. You can't draw a sphere with a compass. And this verse is referring to a two-dimensional circle, and if you continue reading it, which Ray did not, it goes on to say, It is he who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. Obviously, this is referring to a flat surface, and the sky as a canvas or a tent that is spread over it. This is the same earth model that many primitive cultures depicted the earth as a disk with the sky as a canvas. We all realize now, and have for a few hundred or thousands of years, that the sky is not a canvas, but rather a gargantuan sea of space containing cosmic objects and clusters, many of which are thousands, millions, or billions of times larger than the tiny blue dot we're clinging to as it orbits insignificantly among the other celestial bodies. Many ancient cultures were aware that our planet is spherical, however, one of which was the Hindus. In their holy text, the Rig Veda, which I mentioned earlier, in Book 30, chapter 4 and verse 5, it bluntly states, the shape of the earth is an oblate spheroid. The Rig Veda is significantly older than the Bible and contains cosmological knowledge which is exponentially more descriptive than anything in the entire Bible. The Bible fails to even accurately describe the shape of the earth or even attempt to describe the scale of space or the galactic bodies in it. The Bible refers to the earth as having corners many times, and it refers to the earth as being flat in over 50 verses. The Bible, aside from referring to the sky as a canvas or tapestry in many verses is also completely wrong when it comes to stars. A star could never zip around the sky like a pointer in a video game and lead you or some wise men to a specific location like uh, perhaps a manger where a virgin somehow just gave birth. Stars are massive. They are more than little dots in the sky. Even the ones we can see with our naked eye are hundreds or tens of thousands of light years away and they are hundreds of times larger than our own planet. One could never pinpoint anyone to a certain location. You could dismiss the nativity star as a magic 
magic orb or something, but if that were the case, why didn't Yahweh specify this? Why did he call it a star? And then the Bible is wrong about stars again in Matthew 24 and 29 and in Mark 13 and 25. Jesus tells his disciples that in the last days all of the stars will fall from the sky and that the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Several verses in Revelation also prophesy these same primitive mythical events. It is physically impossible for any star to start falling and especially towards Earth. Stars are hundreds of thousands of times larger than Earth with tens of millions of times our own mass. To even imagine that one could fall to Earth is laughable. But even if some magic did possess these stars to leave their galactic orbits, and even if they traveled at the speed of light, it would take over four years for the nearest star besides our sun to even reach us, and billions of years for the furthest of them to catch up, but we would all be baked before Proxima Centauri even entered our solar system. The primitive writers were also unaware that the sun was a star, and in Revelation, when it mentions all of the stars falling to Earth, it says that the sun will disappear. But why wouldn't it fall along with the stars? It is a star. In Genesis 1 and 16, it reads, God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. The sun is a star, but the writers of the Bible weren't aware of this. And the stars are also lights to their own planets. And as I've said before, many of them are hundreds or thousands of times larger than the sun itself. You'd think this would be worth noting, and what about the other astronomical objects, the other planets, the galaxies, the nebula, the globular clusters, black holes, supernovas, pulsars, and quasars? Are they not worth noting? In the same verse, the Bible refers to the moon as a light source, which it is not, as well as in Matthew 24, 29. The Hindus, however, were once again savvy on this. In the Rig Veda, book 1, chapter 84 and verse 15, it says, the moving moon always receives a ray of light from the sun. The Bible is completely ignorant of the cosmos, and even if it were to refer to the earth as an oblate sphere, that wouldn't be impressive, but it can't even do that. Matthew Murray is considered the father of oceanography. He noticed the expression, the paths of the sea, in Psalm 8 verse 8, written 2,800 years ago. And he said, If God said there are paths in the sea, I'm going to find them. Moray then took God at his word and went looking for these paths, and we are indebted to his discovery of the warm and cold continental currents. His book on oceanography remains a basic text on the subject and is still used in universities. Matthew Murray wasn't the first to discover this, and his work was based on Juan Ponce de Leon, Benjamin Franklin, and other people's discoveries prior to his own. He definitely progressed our scientific knowledge of the subject, but it wasn't from the Bible. He simply wanted to credit it because he was a Christian. If the writers of the Bible were aware of the paths of the sea, that'd be cool, I don't care. But the verse is far too vague to know exactly what they were referring to. It could have been referring to rivers or streams. And after all, the Bible isn't known for its accurate labels when it comes to aquatic bodies. The Gospel of Mark refers to Lake Chinnereth as the Sea of Galilee. Mark fantasizes Jesus and his disciples journeying nine hours across this exaggerated pond and has them battling treacherous storms capable of demolishing cargo ships. But in reality, it's a small lake which canoes paddle across in less than two hours. Moving on. In the book of Job, chapter 38, verse 35, God asked Job a very strange question back in 1500 BC. He asked, Can you send out lightnings that they may go and say to you, Here we are? This says that light can be sent and then manifest itself in speech. Oh God, just please make it stop. This is just supposed to be Yahweh bragging to Job about how powerful he is. In verse 34 he says he can summon rain, and in verse 35 he says he can summon lightning. That's all that it is. It doesn't say anything about radio waves or Wi-Fi or anything else like that. It's not talking about wireless charging. And if this was some sort of scientific revelation, why wasn't Job the first one to invent telephones or radio or internet? Obviously he didn't because obviously the information is not there. Ray, just take off your tinfoil hat. Even most Christians are face palming at you along with me. Genesis chapter 2 verse 1 says, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. Everything is finished. Nature is complete. 
The brilliance of the light-giving sun is finished. The blue skies are finished. Nothing has a half-evolved eye or ear or leg or brain. It's all finished. From the animals to man to winged birds to the beauty and fragrance of a rose that blossoms to God's glory and for our pleasure. Nothing is evolving. Everything is finished. Just as the Bible says. Jesus f***ing Christ. At this point, I'm finished. The first few scientific facts you mentioned were a lot of fun, but at this point you're just trying to stretch your list out to 10 so you can get that top 10 in the title of your video. Do I even have to respond to this? Like, do I actually have to respond to this? I don't think anyone out there is as brain dead as Ray Comfort, but in case anyone is, I'll lay it out there for you. But to be honest, I think I give every Christian more credibility than that. The first law of thermodynamics states that neither matter nor energy can be created or destroyed. Energy can be changed, moved, controlled, stored, or dissipated. However, it cannot be created from nothing or reduced to nothing. So already I have no idea what relevance this has to the point that Ray is trying to make. I suppose he's saying that the evolution of species would be creating new matter from nothing, but that isn't how it works. When you have a child, you don't create new energy energy or matter, you simply convert energy and matter into a new organism. And do this for a few million generations and there will be random mutations and environmental factors leading to natural selection of certain features. But no new matter or energy has been created. Also mentioning the first law of thermodynamics is a stupid decision when you're literally reading the creation story in Genesis. The first law states that matter and energy cannot be created from nothing, but that's exactly what's described in Genesis 1 and 2. And also what about the thousands of fish and loaves of bread that Jesus created out of nothing in Matthew 14, 15 through 21, and in the duplicate of the same story in the next chapter, Matthew 15, 32 through 38. That is in complete opposition of the laws of thermodynamics. You could explain it all away with magic, but if you do that, why even bring up thermodynamics? Why bring up science? Christians like to mention science when they think it aligns with some Bible story, but then when science doesn't, they either appeal to magic or say that the science is wrong. That's awfully convenient. Also, creation myths aren't exclusive to the Bible. Almost every mythology has the universe being created from nothing, being finished by their deities. So if this was even remotely a scientific fact or whatever, it would be equally applicable to every religion and mythology that's ever existed. Genesis chapter 6, God gave Noah the dimensions of the 1.5 million cubic foot ark he was to build. It's interesting to note that in 1993, a scientific study was conducted by the South Korean world-class ship research center, Crisco. They compared 12 hulls of different shapes and discovered that no modern design outperformed the biblical model. The length of the ark was six times its width and ten times its height. Many contemporary ships are built with similar proportions, although the length to breadth ratio is usually chosen with regard to the power required to move them through the water. The ark needed only to keep afloat. People had been building boats and ships for thousands of years when the story of Noah was written. So in the story, the writers gave Noah's Ark the basic ratio of a cargo-like ship. That's nothing special. The construction of boats long predates the story of Noah's Flood. There were canoes in Africa and the Netherlands and Europe over 10,000 years ago. And we've discovered fossilized barge ships in Egypt that date back to around 4,500 years ago. And we even have writings and cave drawings of boats and large ships which date back much further than that. So the writers of Noah would have been aware of the standard ship ratios. However, However, all of the ships that Ray mentions are steel. No wooden ship could hold up to the scale attributed to Noah's Ark. The largest wooden ship ever built was the Wyoming, built in the 1900s by some of the most skilled shipwrights. And even it was 200 feet shorter than what Noah's Ark is imagined to be. But it did not survive the sea. It leaked and finally sank. Wooden ships cannot hold up to such massive scales. And in the story, it took Noah 120 years to build the Ark with a family of four men and four women. That's 960 total man years to build the Ark. Now let's look at Ken Ham's Ark. It took over 1,000 professional construction workers two years to build. That's over 2,000 man years to build, with all the nicest power tools and biggest cranes and machines that modern technology has to offer. And Noah and his two sons supposedly did it, along with their wives, none of which had ever built a boat before, twice as fast, and with no power tools or massive cranes. And during the 120 years, they still had to grow their own food and harvest it, to feed not only themselves during that time, but store enough for themselves and tens of thousands 
thousands of animals for the 370 days that they would be on the Ark. On top of that, Ken Ham's Ark had lumber delivered on the job site, already prepared in the lumber mill. So the man years we calculated didn't even account for that. Noah and his sons and their wives would have had to go out, chop down the trees themselves, haul them all the way back, and prepare the boards without a lumber mill, all before even getting started on the Ark. And I don't know if you've seen Mesopotamia or not, but trees are quite scarce. And the Ark had one window, but contained tens of thousands of animals, they would have all died from methane poisoning. And while we're on the subject of science and Noah's Ark, where did all of the water come from, and where did it go? The Bible says that the flood waters rose above the mountains and completely covered everything in sight. Even if all of the ice on the entire planet melted, the oceans would rise only about 200 feet. In order for water to cover the peaks of every mountain on the planet, the oceans would have to rise over 25,000 feet. The amount of water on the planet would have to multiply roughly three times the amount we currently have. Some apologists say that the Earth didn't have mountains yet, but in Genesis 719, the Bible says that the Earth had high mountains and that they were covered by the flood all around the Earth. The story is bogus. In Leviticus 13, verse 46, the Bible speaks of quarantine long before medical science discovered the importance of isolating those with infectious diseases. In 1490 BC, it gives instructions on what to do if someone has leprosy. He shall be unclean. All the days that he has the sore, he shall be unclean. He is unclean, and he shall dwell alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. Hey Yahweh. What do you want, Jeffrey? Your chosen people are suffering and dying of leprosy, and they're praying to you really hard, asking if maybe you could help them out. Yeah, yeah, I guess I could do something. Since you're all-powerful and all-knowing and omniscient and omnipotent and omnibenevolent, maybe you could reveal a cure to them, perhaps show them some herbs to cure the disease, or maybe teach them how to create medicines for it, or perhaps inform them on how to produce vaccines to prevent them from even getting leprosy in the first place. I'll do something. Oh my god, we've been praying for you. Are you here to help us? I am that I am. My mother has leprosy. What do we do? Kick her out of the camp. She can live by herself. That way none of you guys will have to deal with her. Jesus Christ. In Job 40 verse 15, God himself speaks to Job of a creature he created called Behemoth. Some Bible commentators believe this creature is a hippopotamus, as does this particular commentator. Behold now Behemoth, which I made with you. He eats grass as an ox. Lo, his strength is at his loins, and his force is in the navel of his belly. He moves his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. His bones are as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. He is the chief of the ways of God. He who made him can make his sword to approach unto him. Surely the mountains bring him forth food, where all the beasts of the field play. He lies under the shady trees in the covert of the reed and fens. The shady trees cover him with their shadow. The willows of the brook compass him about. Behold, he drinks up a river. He hastens not. He trusts that he can draw up Jordan unto his mouth. He takes it with his eyes. His nose pierces through sneers. Science can only speculate as to why the dinosaur disappeared. But the answer may be in this passage of scripture. As we have seen, some commentators think this is a reference to the hippopotamus. However, one of the characteristics of this massive animal was that it had a tail that is likened to a cedar which is a very large tree. Clearly, the hippopotamus doesn't qualify. The behemoth in Job is certainly not a dinosaur, but claiming that it does, does sell a lot of merchandise and propaganda books to gullible children. Con artists like Ken Ham and Ken Hoven are very aware of this. 
Christians don't seem to care if their movies, music, or science are trash garbage. They'll mindlessly consume it and love every bit of it if you put Jesus' name in it enough. I've noticed in my personal social circles that followers of Answers in Genesis are the same type of people who believe you can turn a lightning cable into a cordless charger with a copper wire and electrical tape after watching a video on Facebook, or believe that Back to the Future 4 is coming out after seeing a fan-made trailer on YouTube. Followers of AIG are not the brightest bulbs in the pack. So, what about the behemoth? Why isn't it a Brachiosaurus? For one, you'd think that Yahweh would mention the incredibly long neck of the sauropod, as that is one of its most identifiable features. It has commonly been assumed that the behemoth is referring to a hippopotamus. A hippo fits all of the descriptions, and in verse 21, it mentions that the behemoth spends much of its time in the wetlands. Other speculations are that the behemoth could have been a rhinoceros or elephant, who both fit the descriptions as well, so it's very possible. The only reason people like Kent Hovind and Ken Ham say that the behemoth couldn't have been any of these large mammals is because of verse 17, which reads, He stiffens his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are knit together. Hippos and elephants don't have tails like a cedar. I mean, look at them, they're tiny. But is this verse really referring to their tail? Let's look at the same verse in the 1599 Geneva Bible. The Geneva Bible is based on the original Latin and Hebrew manuscripts rather than later translations, which is what the King James and other popular translations did. The Geneva Bible is much more accurate. So let's look at the verse in the Geneva Bible. It is as follows. When he taketh pleasure, his tail is like a cedar. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. Why would an animal's tail become like a cedar when it takes pleasure? Unless it's not a tail. This translation obviously makes the appendage being referred to much clearer, and the latter part of the verse is certainly describing the beast's testicles, which is why most translations use the word stones. The Hebrew word pathar, which is used here, is also used in Leviticus 21.20 to refer to a man's testicles. So if the latter part of the verse is describing the beast's testicles and the first is referring to a tail which extends and becomes firm when the beast takes pleasure, it is rather obvious that this is not a tail, but indeed a big old dick. Pixels and Papyrus has a great video which delves into more of the Hebrew language and its practice used in this verse, and I'll link to it in the description. I highly recommend everyone to check it out and subscribe to his channel, he's got a plethora of educational videos. But did dinosaurs coexist with humans? Absolutely not. Not once have dinosaur and human fossils ever been found overlapping one another in the fossil record, and we have no accounts in the Bible or any other ancient human writings of dinosaurs living with men. If dinosaurs coexisted with humans, they would have definitely been written about and probably worshipped. But even if we assume that they did, and assume that the Bible is true, why did Yahweh create millions of species only to wipe them out in less than 4,000 years? Did he create them because they looked cool, but then later realized that they were too much of a threat to humans, so he had to kill them out? That's pretty embarrassing. And if you believe that the dinosaurs were saved in Noah's boat, and then died shortly after the flood due to post-flood atmosphere and climate, why didn't Yahweh simply let them drown? What was the point in putting them in the boat if they were just going to die afterwards? Yahweh sounds much more like Epimetheus than Prometheus. The Bible contains absolutely no scientific foreknowledge, but rather contains the same level of scientific ignorance that we would expect to see in a book written by primitive, superstitious nomads. This video could be extensively longer, but I think I've at least covered enough to put an end to some of these ridiculous arguments. I might make a second part to this video in the future where I delve specifically into the scientific ignorance of the Bible instead of the supposed scientific foreknowledge. But for now, I'm ready to call it a day. Leave a comment down below with your favorite scientific inaccuracy in the Bible, and don't forget to subscribe and click that bell button if you want to be notified whenever I upload. I don't require you to cut off your foreskin or be dunked in water, all you have to do is click a button and you'll be part of the community. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.